World for Cosmos Tis Autopsias. Despair. When a person loses all hope. It's true, and I should know, because even this was a world I had to destroy, and when I'm glad, I destroy it. I got there in the usual way, this time while taking my first semester exams. Either that book does have a sense of humor, or it is just a massive prick. The pages of the book riffled and pushed against the confines of its bag, and the students at their desks looked up and around as a loud murmur spread throughout the hall. I could hear the book jumping under the table and wriggling free. In a moment of pure impulse, I made the trees outside cover the windows with their branches and darken the room. The murmur became screams and shrieks echoing all around. The book fell open on the floor and drew me in. Floating in that black sphere of absolute darkness, I angrily slung curses back at it. Slowly, I calmed down, and the darkness cleared with my anger. I was in a huge city. Tall skyscrapers and grand government buildings surrounding on all sides. The people each seemed subtly off. One had a slightly disproportioned face, another an extremely deep voice, sounding almost like it came from the pit of hell. Another had huge fists and meaty fingers. The city was noisy and bustling with activity. I looked around and observed the place, trying to see the catch or the thing that would kill me, or, you know, the usual stuff like the shadow that seems to move wrongly, or a too conspicuous person. I saw none of that. But my time was soon to be filled with despair. I wandered the streets for what must have been a few days, feeding off the scraps from a restaurant and water from a park fountain nearby. I gave up searching and applied to work as a barista at a coffee shop. After working for maybe four or five months and sleeping in the break room, I met the woman who would become my wife. She walked into the shop, and I greeted her with a smile, saying, Welcome to the Cedar Coffee Cove. What will you be having today? She was wearing a dark blue wool sweater, and a plain light green t-shirt underneath. Grey leggings, white pumps, long uncombed hair, and the freckles that dotted her face. I remember it all. I'll have an espresso and two slices of St. Blackberry cake, she said. Sure, I replied. She was so radiant and so beautiful. I fell hard and fast. She kept coming to the shop each day for a week. A month. Until I finally asked her out. She smiled and said, yes. That evening we went to the movies watched some cheesy romantic comedy, and walked to her home right afterward. It was a decent two-bedroom apartment, with abstract paintings adorning the walls, and mostly homemade decor. She walked towards me, and we kissed. I should have known that I was going to be fucked over, but alas... Even harbingers can't predict everything that might happen in a world. We dated for a few years. Or it could have been longer. I kept getting promoted at work 
and things were looking up for us as I walked around the coffee shop, asking questions to the customers and being friendly. Her name was Natalie. I got a call at work. It was her. Ronald, I need you. Come to the apartment. Quick. I panicked, remembering that I was still a harbinger, and that bad luck, misfortune, and absolute despair are what we always will receive. I'll tell you about it later, but be warned it might surprise you that this harbinger business is not always pleasant. Even some psychopathic harbingers are revolted by the things the world could make them do. I ran home and saw her holding a wedding ring. Ronald, will you? I ran forward and hugged her and whispered in her ears. Yes. You beautiful fool, yes. The marriage went perfectly. And then... Then came the trauma. A few weeks after the wedding, as I got home, the door was already open, and I saw two figures standing over her form, hurting her, torturing Natalie's body. The floor was slick with blood, and she was already dead, but they just kept cutting the flesh. Slashing, mutilating, twisting. I tried to run to her, but never got any closer. I tried to shout, but there was no sound. I tried to look away. It seemed to go on for more than hours or days. Somehow, it seemed like weeks. Then, they suddenly halted, looked at me for the first time, and smiled sadistically. Before they just faded away. Released from something, I fell to my knees. A single tear finally came, and as it rolled down my cheek, the world spun around and turned to darkness, and in Natalie's voice I heard, I'll always love you, Ronald. Always. At that moment, I almost lost all control. I just wanted to destroy everything around me. No. Destroy. Everything. But something in my gut told me to not do anything rash. In fact, not to do anything at all. I reluctantly calmed myself and waited for the world's master or a minion sent by them. The broken body lay there and nothing came for a few eternities at the very least. I felt like the universe died and regenerated around me, and I was unfazed by it. The pain of losing her was too great. I was numb, just filled with despair. Eventually, I felt it just start to lighten, and saw a light moving towards me, and it felt like Natalie, but I knew it wasn't. It took me upwards, and it was a person that looked like Natalie. It was as if she was being played as a character in some sort of TV show or movie. She looked wrong, even though her features were exactly the same. This one was a copy, a knockoff, nothing more. This made me furious. How dare you make mockery out of the woman I love? I was about to lunge at the figure, but then something in the back of my head told me not to. I knew, perhaps because of Natalie's soul still with me, or my own harbinger instincts. 
the figure spoke in a voice that was like Natalie's, but somehow with hints of malice and evil in the tone. It asked, Have you experienced pain? Despair? I wanted to fling a hundred curses at it, but I just said, Yes. This made the figure smile slightly. Then it turned and walked away, saying, Much more is to come. Be aware, Harbinger. The world faded slowly away, to be replaced by the sounds of my class shouting, Something about a tree demon? Remembering my little stunt with the trees, I ordered them to go back slowly and return to the place they were before. The dimness receded, and light poured through the windows. The teacher cleared her throat and asked us to continue writing, as we still had two hours to finish our papers. I must have done so, but I remember nothing until, moving to set my pen down, I found the orb in my palm. I clutched it and wordlessly walked to my dorm on campus. I locked the door, looked at the orb, and saw its power, one that sent me reeling. The ability to send a person into their worst nightmare or their worst trauma. I waited for the image of a grave I had to visit like before, but instead the image was of a building, one that I knew from this world, from this town. I walked there, and as it came into view, I realized that this was the one which had burned down under mysterious circumstances years before. Maybe a harbinger decided to go crazy with their powers. As I reached the main doors, the orb rose up as the other had done at the grave, and nosedived into the ground below. As I turned to go, a photograph fluttered down from a window in the building. I picked it up and saw it was of Natalie. I stared, incredulous and baffled, but then I realized maybe she was the master of the world. Just maybe. As I walked away with the photo, I wondered about other harbingers, and if I could meet them some day. I was about to meet them, and it wouldn't be pleasant. <laughs>